Aš sakau, ar dar... Ai, pirza, ta šimtai švečiau, man daigi, kad jie jūs neduodas. Ne, ne. Taip, dabar eisime prie Devinėgio akmenų. Pasisensite jūs akmenų skutinį. Tiesiog. Stiprimi. O kurį yra tik žinau aš vieną. Ai, ai, ai. What does the dance mean to the dancers? How do we measure the beliefs that set those feet in motion? What we believe about our past shapes our view of who we are as human beings and how we are capable of living. We can dream of a culture of harmony and peace in balance with nature but has there ever been one? Archaeologist Maria Gimbut has said, yes. She told a new origin story, that at the very beginning of Western civilization lay cultures that were long-lasting and peaceful. Maria Gimbutas was born in Lithuania, a land tucked away in northeast Europe where remnants of an ancient world still linger, passed down through families, like these potters whose art reflects the myths and songs that left an abiding impression on Maria. She was forced to flee the Soviet occupation of her homeland during World War II. Refugees throughout the war, Maria Gimbutas and her family immigrated to the United States, where she became a world-renowned archaeologist whose scientific theories have sparked a great debate. Her theories are deep and complex. But simply put, they paint a new picture of the earliest layer of Western cultures. Long before written history began in Sumer and Egypt, settlements in the forest clearings and riverbanks of Southeast Europe achieved a high level of culture and art. 8,000 years ago in the Neolithic or New Stone Age, Agriculture, pottery, weaving, and herding were already being practiced. The first farming communities where women and men lived showed no evidence of organized warfare. They left behind thousands of artifacts, a rich legacy of paintings, pottery sculptures, and figurines, all connected to goddesses and gods who are at the center of a rich religious life. The primordial deity for our ancestors was female, Maria wrote, a self-generating goddess, giver of life, wielder of death, and regeneratrix. She was the unity of all life in nature. Her power was in water and stone, in tomb and cave, in animals and birds, snakes and fish, hill, trees and flowers. She was there for millennia, and she was always sacred, because what our forefathers understood was sacred earth, living earth. Mother Earth figure is everywhere in European folklore to this day, and she is the metaphor of, of living earth, nothing else. I saw with my own eyes in these rather primitive corners of Lithuania when not only women, but also men were kissing earth in the morning. 
also the belief that Mother Earth is a lawgiver. You cannot deceive Earth. You must respect Earth, especially in the spring when, when she is pregnant. You cannot beat her. That was alive. Maria traced a continuity of sacred earth symbols going back to the earliest human art. The old stone age with their vibrant images of animals and female forms. The Paleolithic goddess was the creatrix. Her body parts like breasts, belly, buttocks, vulva, are the procreative parts of the body. And this shows that she is the creatrix. So I can speak in detail about the functions of the goddess, about the existence even not of one great goddess or great mother goddess, but about many types of goddesses. These images are not portraits. They're not personified portraits. They're amalgams of animals and birds with female form. They have all these attributes that open your imagination. She opened up the, diverse, the diversity of the Neolithic religious imagery. It's our language from eight, 10,000 years ago, you know. This is, this is how we understood the world. This is how we spoke about, about life. If you don't like the term goddess because it comes out of classical Greek culture as a term or whatever, that's okay. But what this represents as part of our spiritual tradition of who we are is probably as old as human evolution. In every culture, the symbolism and the metaphors and the myths that they create are their way of um, interacting with the great mythic drama that we all live in, which is the unfolding of the universe, the earth turning around the sun, the seasons changing, uh, the elements rising, the tides, the rhythms of the moon. How shall we connect with this? How shall we create our cultural story? But she knew that uh, the symbol system was central to the meaning of people's lives in these cultures. Maria was the first scholar to bring together a comprehensive picture of this area she named Old Europe. Among its dozens of regional cultures, she found many similarities in symbolism, social structure, economy, and art. From their house sites, temples, and grave goods, Maria drew a picture of cooperative and peaceful societies, which lasted much longer than the empires that came later. To date, over 3,000 sites have been documented, and tens of thousands of miniature sculptures have been found, made of clay, marble, bone, copper, and gold. I started excavations in 1967, continued to about 1980, and excavated in four places, mainly in Yugoslavia, Greece, Italy. All these excavations were important for my personal research because at that time I was discovering figurines myself. I discovered at least 500 sculptures. 
and it was not just sculptures, but the whole the whole sequence of Neolithic culture starting from 6500 BC up to the fourth millennium and even later. From the excavations, I was learning what I was reading in the books, and then I could prove by spade. And so she really put uh, old Europe on the map as a coherent concept, which was this wonderful flourishing of culture before the Bronze Age, when they had very well developed villages, when they did a lot of art, produced these figurines, when metallurgy was initiated. The massive synthetic abilities of her mind to piece together chronologically hundreds and hundreds of sites and different cultures all over Europe and track their interrelationships and all of that is, is just massive. She's pointing out a whole time here, and it's a time where Everyone's roughly equal in rank. It's a female-centered culture, not male-dominated. It's relatively peaceful. People can live like that and still maintain a large village and an elaborate culture. Some of the Lake Kukateni things had, those villages had 15,000 people living in them. Kukatini, Vincha, Sesclo. Our history books never told us these names. Perhaps because without kings, warfare, and conquest, they don't fit the classic definition of civilization. We can clearly make a statement, all the Europe is a peaceful culture without weapons. And the whole archaeological record, starting from the Paleolithic times, from the cave art, there are no scenes of people fighting each other, no groups of people fighting each other, no single people. Before what we think of a civilization, I was like everybody else, you know, civilization begins at Sumer, and it's always been warfare, and it's always been weapons, and it's always been kings and rulers, and. And somehow before that we were killer apes, you know. It was like straight from the killer apes to, to the killer guys, and you know, and, which is a very depressing view of history. And so someone who tells us that there were civilizations that could be peaceful, this is very threatening to um, everything we've been taught. And it's not only threatening to the power of men in our society, but to the way in which we've accepted that militarism is necessary, that the way to resolve conflict, the only way is to have a standing army. So she's really asking us, is the way we're living the best way to live? At first I thought, this is all fantasy. I could not imagine a time that was free from war. But after a lot of denial, and. I began to carefully consider what she had written and examine her, her works more carefully, and it was like a deeply religious experience. To be swept out of one world and, and to be uh, drawn into a, a much vaster and deeper uh, sense of the universe. She's describing a world in which people were very connected. They were connected to the life process. They were connected to the seasonal cycle. They were connected to the understanding that the uh, sacred is in the earth. The connections then and the ritual objects that you found, which really had to do with the forces of nature. It isn't that nature and culture are separate, but that culture, that nature is part of culture or culture is part of nature. And this is part of the, certainly the evidence from the um, Neolithic, uh, what she calls Old Europe.
The Neolithic is the moment when the, uh, the, the humans that moved, you know, the hunters, the gatherers, when they finally settled down. And this is the, you know, it's the birth, really, of civilization and of a, of a settled uh, human culture. Civilization exists when people can pursue the arts, pottery making, singing, dancing. We have evidence of all of this from the earliest Neolithic throughout Old Europe. Gorgeous pottery, intricate designs, and they're relatively consistent throughout Old Europe. Maria's belief, which I happen to agree with, is that this artistic aesthetic was interwoven with their religious beliefs. The three great creations of the Neolithic Revolution were agriculture, weaving, and the art of pottery making. These three great creations were connected to the goddess because the relationship between the seed and how you get it to go into the earth and when you harvest it and how you then make bread out of it. This was a great mystery of transformation. And this is the essence of the mysteries of the goddess religion. So sometimes people say, well, they had a goddess, but how do we know that women had power? And it's because women had invented pottery, weaving, and agriculture, that they would have had a high social role. Yes, pottery is women's textile, also women's. Then household is women's. And the supervising of everything was in women's hands. This is what can we reconstruct from the Neolithic uh, finds. Her interpretations were based upon an enormous amount of work. Primary research. Not only primary research in the field, but primary research in investigating the historic documents in their original languages. Then in northeastern Greece, I excavated together with Colin Renfrew, who later became my opponent, <laughs> although we published books together. It's true that even in the excavation there were some differences. Maria was particularly interested in the figurines. Maria was really eager to open an excavation where there was an early Neolithic layer because she really wanted to see what the beginning of an agricultural settlement, what the material culture would be like. And uh, C degree was extremely rich. It had over 200 figurines. In the very beginning, it was still not very clear to me what are these figurines? Why are there are so many? Then she developed her ideas about it, uh, and one was that she could really understand the religion of these people from the figurines. She jumped to the conclusion, to the old conclusion that others reached before her, that all these different representations of women were all the goddess in different guises, in different manifestations. And of course, they used the notion of the goddess, which I think is meaningless. Now, once you get on that, once you insist every time you see a figurine of a woman, you say, well, it's the goddess. And if you point out it's very different from that one, well, it's a goddess under a different manifestation, that is no methodology. You can just say, well, everything is a goddess. And indeed, for Maria, in a way, everything became the goddess. Early religion to Maria was not about sacred texts or dogmas but about the great creative powers embodied in the natural world, the interwoven patterns that tie the universe together, birth, growth, death, and regeneration. 
Maria's view of the goddess, she would say it with emphasis. She would say, it's not about fertility. It is about regeneration. Always out of every death, there's a rebirth. Always after an ending comes a new beginning. It's the organic flow. It's the organic cycle. So that's what she was talking about. What Maria really did, and I, I believe this absolutely, whether I, whether I go along with all of her ideas or not, she set the agenda. She started to write about the figurines when there were two other people who had written about the figurines. And nobody was writing about the figurines because they didn't know what to say. And she wrote about them and she said all these things and for a while there were very few reviews because the reviewers didn't know what to say. But she, she set the agenda and it's, it's caused all this scholarship and she loved that. She absolutely loved that. You have to remember that all historians of religion don't know very much about the deep religious past and that much of what historians are talking about as the history of their own um, religions in the deep past is, is a great deal of conjecture. So why not have these sets of conjectures for us to think about? She had folk ideas about religion and not just um, theologians' views or historians' views of what was important. She had common people's views. And in the common people's view, the small figurines, the small statues, the, the uh, presence of divinities in daily life is much more prominent. But our scholars don't even know how to think about that. The common people of Lithuania, the old women of the fields and markets, had always been one of Maria's sources of inspiration. In the homes of country people, with their pottery, weavings, and carvings, Maria in her youth had seen many of the patterns and designs she would later find in the artifacts of old Europe. Common things encoded hidden symbols, Maria discovered, as she studied the rich folklore and folk art that surrounded her. Not so long ago, Maria wrote, the Lithuanian countryside was dotted with beautifully ornamented poles, capped by roofs and crosses whose symbols radiated brilliant sunlight. They rose from the earth as the folk song had risen out of religious beliefs. Under the Soviets, Maria's early works documenting Lithuanian folk culture and symbolism were considered subversive and banned. But beginning in 1968, after two decades of exile, she was able to return home as a visiting lecturer at the University of Vilnius. In 1981, she came for three months. Her lectures helped inspire the Lithuanian resistance with a sense of their own rich culture. And throughout her lifetime, she continued to return to her homeland. When you excavated in Lithuania, you found in the grave goods material culture which still was reflected in present-day Lithuania folk custom. So she felt that if you studied the folk customs, the ethnography, if you studied the folk tales and the folk songs and you knew the actual history, and the language that you could put all these things together and you might be able to reach some aspect of what is always so ambiguous, prehistoric religion. Because you see, she saw that in Lithuania. The religion of old Europe changed radically towards the end of the third millennium. Horseback riding peoples from the Russian steppes Maria called Korgans swept across Europe in three great waves of invasions over several thousand years. 
And that collision is reflected everywhere, in mythology and in language. Villages are often fortified. You also have class stratification. Some people's grave is big, loaded with loot, loaded with stuff, beautiful museum pieces, and some people's graves aren't. You've got some people that are rich and some people that are poor. And from the very beginning, they had weapons. I dealt with weapons, with the hill force, all that. I spent 10 years on that. Hierarchical, male-ruled, they worshipped a sky god and brought a new religion. They spoke an ancestral Indo-European tongue which spread with their migrations. New gods clashed with old traditions. This collision of cultures transformed the old myths and values and changed the heart of old Europe. If you read the epics, if you look at the art, if you look at what's on the pottery, um, look at the, um, the writings of Homer, what you can see there is that there was a conflict between the old earth deities and the sky deities. There's really nothing surprising in what she's saying. She's just kind of proven what many people had speculated about during the 19th and early 20th century. And, and she put that old European society on the map. She showed us that it was really there. From the mythic world of old Europe, Maria's life journey took her into the world of the scientist where her early works on the Bronze Age established her reputation as a world-renowned scholar. Here at the Pacifica Institute in Santa Barbara, her archives are preserved. Maria's later works on the Neolithic pioneered the discipline of archaeomythology, bringing together studies in archaeology, folklore, ethnology, linguistics, and mythology. Interpretations from one field could be checked against the evidence of other fields. She also spoke about her satisfaction when the various disciplines would line up and give the same picture of, uh, of what she was looking at. And she said, that's my satisfaction, to find out what this means. In her lifetime, she published hundreds of articles and 20 major books translated into many languages as archaeology restricted its focus to statistics and material culture, Maria broadened hers. She insisted that to understand our ancestors, we must consider their belief systems, which she saw encoded in their art. The Goddesses and Gods of Old Europe, published in 1974, was the beginning of a deep split with her colleagues. I mean, she was very, very well respected until she went into this material. She took a leap of faith by interpreting, saying that she could understand what this was pointing to. And I think that's where, you know, she sort of stepped off the map with, with archaeology, is that she took it into the language of imagery and of uh, mythology and of um, uh, poetry. And this is as far as you could get, really, from the econometric grip of archaeology during the 50s and 60s, where the idea is to excavate a culture, figure out the economic production and relations, and all these artifacts are epiphenomenal, you know, and some kind of religious stuff. I mean, it was the modern economist mentality put onto the excavation. The other thing that makes Maria Gambudis extremely controversial with archaeologists is mythology. Most archaeologists don't have a good background in mythology. Maria Gambudis came into the field with a damn good background in folklore. She'd been out there collecting folk stories in the fields before World War II broke out. Summer was still peaceful in the 1930s when Maria and her sweetheart, Jurgis Gimbutas, wandered the back roads of Zucchia searching for singers of old songs.
I was interested, of course, in folklore because uh, throughout my high school years, I already participated in ethnographical expeditions and I collected folk songs. When I was 16, 17, I collected at least about 5,000 folk songs myself. Even today in Zukia, the ancient songs called Dionos are still sung. The Dionos preserved Lithuania's oral history and culture. Maria described them like the rhythms of a bird, a wedding dance, a lament, a liturgy of nature and the milestones of everyday life. Here, at this point, I start to understand what is the ancient song and what the song was in the very beginning. You, you did everything singing and your song traversed the earth. And the woman, even working hard, was happy because she had the song with her. And her belief system was connected to what she expressed in songs. So that stayed with me for, for the whole of life. I was a privileged child. When I have a difficult time now, I go back to my childhood, to abundance of love around me. Maria and her cousin Mele grew up together. Their mothers were sisters, and the households were closely intertwined. <laughs> Mele and her daughter Inga and her granddaughter Usteya are respected scholars and hard-working women in their professions, typical of this remarkable family. In 1921, when Maria was born, Vilnius was under Polish occupation. The family apartment was the center of her parents' efforts to preserve Lithuanian culture and restore independence. Danielis Alseka was also a doctor. Together they established the first Lithuanian hospital in Vilnius. Ne personally, ne privati, o būtent at visa taligorinė buvo orientuota padėti Vilniaus krašto. Ir štai Marijai šitas ta aplinka, ta dvasia, jį pasiliko visam gyvenimui. My father was so busy, he was out, out all the time. He returned home at night, and I, I remember the smoke. He smoked cigarettes, and I slipped in. I was sitting on his lap, and I also started reading, sitting on his lap from newspapers. And this is how I learned to, to read. So that was my father. He was very passionate, loved me very much. My mother was more pragmatic. She was holding everything in her hands. In my childhood, when I was at school, I used to disappear in the city, my beloved city, Vilnius, 
and go through the courtyards, through the gates, and then visit churches. I love churches, especially Baroque churches. And I didn't say anything to my parents that I went to the church. <laughs> this was secret. But uh, the connection with churches, with nature, with flowers, with smells, with mushrooms and berries, with animals, I think this was important. But then at the end of the high school, especially after my father's death when I was 15, it was a terrible shock. It was the beginning of a new Maria interested in death problem, birth and death, regeneration, afterlife. And then I became a good student. Peace was shattered when the Soviets invaded Lithuania in 1940. At that time, I was writing my dissertation about burial rights. So you can imagine the conditions. They started to ship people to Siberia. Out of my own family, about 25 people disappeared. With war raging around them, Maria and Jurgis married. At that time, when I was married, I thought, well, what I did now, <laughs> it was a stupidity because I was not ready to marry, not at all. Well, I was married. And then a child was born in 43. Then the Germans invaded. The German occupation brought something different. Again, they started arrests. So who was not arrested now was arrested. The Germans destroy Lithuania's once flourishing Jewish community. Then the Soviets came back. So we either escape or we shall be shipped to Siberia. Lithuanians by the hundreds escaped by way of the Nemenis River. The child was small and we were not practical. Because when, when I fled, I just had my baby in one arm and my dissertation in the other arm and nothing else. At the border, they were offered two choices, Berlin or Vienna. We wanted to go to Vienna. Maria and her family spent the rest of the war as refugees in Austria and Bavaria. When peace came, they went to Tübingen in southern Germany. Tübingen was considered to be one of the best universities and the first university to reopen after the war. I got my PhD degree in two years and my book was published on the burial rights of Lithuania. Then in 47, my second daughter was born. Then started my very good years in that camp, and very good people were around me, and hundreds of babysitters. So I used to take a train back to Tübingen Library, spend days in the library, and my studies began there. I don't say that I finished my studies with a degree. No, I did something else, and so what I did, I returned back to the same, to the folklore studies and to folk art studies, mainly. In 1949, the Gim Buddhist family, together with Jurgis's mother, were finally able to emigrate to the United States. They went to Boston, where Jurgis found work as an engineer, and Maria was offered an unpaid position at Harvard. I received a letter. If you are serious, you can continue your studies. We shall give you an office here. And if you want to produce a work on prehistory of Eastern Europe, you're welcome. Nobody understands the width and the breadth of information that she brought with her. She had this background of mythology. 
Then she had all these languages. And then she had uh, her archaeology training, which was rigorous and European. So here I am at Harvard, and this was already 1950. And I knew that I am the only person who knows East European prehistory in the whole United States. There was practically nobody else. And that was my strength. Like so many women, Maria struggled to balance her professional life and her family life as the mother of now three daughters. What I remember of mother, she would sit down at the piano and, and play maybe a few times a week. We didn't have a television and uh, the living room was a place to, to read, to study, to listen to music. We had lots of company, uh, many interesting uh, writers, intellectual people, so-called intellectuals, <laughs> because my parents belonged to the Lithuanian Cultural Club, which they also led for a few years. Harvard published the prehistory of Eastern Europe, and it was widely read and distributed, although Maria received no advance or royalties. It established her reputation as an expert in Eastern Europe's deep past. So this was the beginning of my career in America. There was no real chance to stay as a woman at Harvard. I knew that I can stay as a research fellow and lecturer, but I probably would never be a professor there. In the 1950s, as a staff member, I couldn't join the faculty club if I went alone, not escorted by men. Also, two libraries were close to women, so that I couldn't, couldn't really stand. I, I, I hated the situation. My relations with my husband, they were also never very wonderful. In 1963, Maria was offered a position at UCLA as a professor. She left her marriage and moved to California. I fell in love with California. I restored my health, and I was suddenly happy at UCLA. And I felt future in front of me. I was thinking of possibilities, what I should do, and what can be created, and this was a very good moment. Maria flourished as a professor, publishing dozens of academic articles and her fourth book on the Balts. In 1965, her monumental work on the Bronze Age cultures in Central and Eastern Europe was published and brought her international acclaim. From then on, I used to get fellowships. Now, of course, in God's work, I don't get fellowships, no grants, nothing. But at that time, perhaps because I was young, I used to get grants. I, I spoke of her generosity because her idea was that if she had a student who was interested in archaeology and she had the funds to support them and she was always getting grants from here and there, that they had to go out into the field because they had to get this experience. She didn't say we should go and do it in the library. She said, no, you have to go into the field. And here she is in the field, 1968, I'd say. She didn't go out there and set out the squares and start excavating with a shovel. She was the person who had a kind of an overall view. She was a synthesizer. She had such a tremendous knowledge of the archaeology that had gone before. Kilion, which began in 1973, was really Maria's dream excavation because it yielded so many figurines, and so many figurines in context. The settlement of Achillion in Greece, dating from the 7th to the 6th millennium BCE, was located in southern Thessaly and belongs to the Sesclo culture.
Hundreds of figurines were found in association with houses, outdoor hearths, bread ovens, and special platforms. Their context furnishing vital clues to their functions. And that's the fun of it. You'll work out how many figurines are there that look like this on this particular site. What do the others look like? They're all talking about the diversity in terms of their shapes and their occurrence. Then you can say, well, um, where are they found? What are they found with? Did they believe in the goddess? Were there goddess worshippers? Were women respected? She worked so hard. I have images of her at her desk. When I stayed with her every morning, I'd get up. She had already been up at the crack of dawn. She's studying, she's reading, she's looking, she's writing, taking notes. She spent hours and hours, hundreds of hours, looking. She begins to connect these images together until eventually, over years, a narrative starts to emerge. And this is a long process. So she's going through all of these pieces. She's going through thousands and thousands of these artifacts and holding them and touching them and looking at them and beginning to see the, seeing the patterns, seeing the, the overlapping patterns is a language in itself. In other words, it's a way of communicating. And that's why her artistic sensibility came to play so deeply in it, because it's not a written language, it's a visual language. The pubic triangle, locus of birth, pleasure, and regeneration, was the primary pictogram of the symbolic language Maria decoded in her most controversial book, the language of the goddess. The triangle morphs into the V or chevron that Maria found marked on hundreds of bird goddess figures. She identified the zigzags and lightning bolts and sinuous meanders with water. Chevrons point to the flowing, nurturing waters of her breasts, source of life, sustenance, and her primal power. Her breasts are like her eyes, which also stream life-giving moisture. The coiled spirals are writhing snakes that shed their skin and come out new again. Symbols of regeneration. In the duck-faced water bird, these symbols combine. The bird lays the eggs that are seeds of rebirth. The fat, fertile goddess, mountain mother, mother earth, is sow, temple body, portal, mother and child, animal mother, the original Madonna. She is linked to the uterine-shaped bull's head his upraised horns are symbols of the birth-giving goddess, whose children are also males. Music makers, bards, shamans. The bone-like death goddess Maria called the stiff nude. From her vulva came rebirth and regeneration. She is the owl, the funerary urn, the bird of prey the meandering soul's journey. The goddess was fish. She had many animal forms. 
egg-like, fertile, watery. She was the womb-like hedgehog, the double-axe butterfly of transformation. And Maria saw these symbols repeat again and again in infinite combinations that spelled out a mythology. What I have done is not a discovery of the goddess. I search uh, for the goddess in Europe, especially where treasures of information were never really touched before me. And I'm very glad I had a chance to do it. Maria presented her interpretations at many international conferences, but was often harshly criticized by her colleagues who disputed her conclusions and did not understand her methods. Anybody who tells us that they know that it's, this is what happened in the past has got to be questioned because we're not going to know this is what happened in the past. We can, if I can just butt in there, that's what's interesting with Maria, that in a way she did challenge authority. She did challenge the established authoritative picture or story of what happened in prehistory by writing about old Europe. On the other hand, she wrote that story in an authoritative fashion, we feel. She felt she had a direct line to these things. So she felt to some extent that she could understand it in an intuitive way. I'd almost say a feminine way, but that might be, I might be criticized by some of your more critical viewers. Uh, but she had uh, a very holistic uh, approach to things. And that's why it was so creative. It was that cross-fertilization of ideas which enabled her to see things which other people hadn't seen. But artists, ecologists, feminists, contemporary goddess worshipers, and social thinkers were deeply inspired by her work. When Maria began to publish her work on the symbolism of old Europe, it just happened to coincide with the second wave of feminism and the development of ecofeminism and the sense of rediscovering the fact that we are connected with this earth. There were um, feminists who found in Maria's ideas the scientist whom they had hoped would support their ideas that once God was a woman. And so she was borne aloft by really a, a lively group of women and pr men too, and she never looked back. So the backlash against her, I think, is part of the backlash against feminism because she got identified with feminism. What she saw and how she interpreted what she saw came from the sum total of her life the depth of her scholarship, her excavations, and her deep roots in Lithuania. A new generation celebrates the summer solstice on this hill near Kaunas. Maintaining a spiritual connection to nature that was a hallmark of Maria's life work. Throughout her lifetime, Maria was awarded many honors and degrees, but none meant so much as the one she received in 1993 from the University of Kaunas on what would be her last visit to Lithuania. Maria died in Los Angeles, February 2nd, 1994. She asked for her ashes to be carried back to Lithuania, her beloved homeland, where goddesses have never been forgotten. Nuestros 
May the Earth Mother Janina hold you in gentle embrace. May the rays of the goddess Sula warm you in winter. May Medina, spirit of the forest, shade you in summer. May Lima, lady of good fortune, bring you all you can conceive. <laughs>